This episode is brought to you by Biddy Casting, a simple casting management tool that creates visual casting calls and posts them to your online social networks and groups. I've used Biddy Casting myself, and what excites me most is the simplicity, both for the filmmakers and casting agents and actors. As an actor, all I had to do was click on the link, fill out a short form, add a pic, that's it. So easy. And it's that simple for the filmmaker and casting side, too. Stop sorting your talent from your inbox. Check out biddycasting.com today and sign up for a free beta account. And also check out episode 15 of Filmmakers Focus to hear from Biddy Casting co-founder Ryan Nelson and get an in-depth look on Biddy Casting. Biddy Casting. Sort talent, not files. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Filmmakers Focus. I'm Doc Kennedy. This week's special guest is Marilyn Anderson. Marilyn is a screenwriter and producer, and I'm excited to have her on because she's going to share her story of going from a lucrative career, totally changing paths, becoming a screenwriter in the process, and So we're going to get to that in just a, a second. I wanted to give you a quick update on what's going on here. First off... There's a new domain for the website, and you'll never guess what it is. It's filmmakersfocus.com. That's right. We're switching it up from dotkennedy.com, where the link was before, and it actually went to filmmakersfocus.wordpress.com. Now it's simplified. You just go to filmmakersfocus.com. They'll take you straight to the podcast, straight to the blogs, and excited to have that up and running. And then what's most exciting for me is tomorrow is my last day at the J-O-B. Yay! Super excited. And I timed it with my birthday. So it's it's an early birthday present for myself. But this job has been awesome. And it's been awesome because I've got to meet some great people. It's been a real learning experience for me in just dealing with people in a different way. And it also, for myself, it just gave me time to reassess where I was and where I wanted to go. The last two years, I've been working freelance video production, and as much as I enjoy that, and I do, uh, my goal has always been feature films. So it gave me a chance to patch things up where they needed to be and get a game plan in place to make the feature films happen. So that's all in the works, and I'm actually going to do maybe an episode, a separate episode, just talking about the game plan with that. But that's super exciting, and that's what's going on here. If you could please do us a favor. This episode's a very important one. They all are. Let's not kid around here. They're all important. So if you could share this episode with people you feel that will encourage, that would be awesome. And if you could leave an iTunes review, that would be awesome as well. Those help us get a little more recognition in the iTunes search engine. So when you're listening to an episode and you're going, man, this is some great stuff. Take that moment, please, and head over and leave us a review and just help us get a little bit more notoriety within the filmmaking genre. So with that said, let's go ahead and jump into our conversation with Marilyn Anderson. And now our feature presentation. Welcome to the show, Marilyn. Oh, thank you, Doc. It's great to be here. I'm super excited to have you on, and here's why. I've I've heard your story, and I I thought I have got to have you on because it's just unique what you've done with your life and your film out, how to beat a bully, how that's all come to fruition. But can you just share with us a little bit about how you got into show business and really why you got into show business in the first place? Oh, absolutely. I was actually uh, in college in a totally different field. I got a couple of degrees in biology and physiology. Which is a typical screenwriter, right? Typical, typical, <laughs> right. And I don't even write about biological things. <laughs> so after I got out of grad school and I was working uh, at the National Academy of Sciences as a biomedical information specialist, and one day I said, I don't want to do this. I want to be a star. So I quit my job and sold my car and sold my furniture and sold my boyfriend. <laughs> Didn't get much for him. And I moved to New York to become a star. And believe it or not, I got into a Broadway show the first week that I was there. Wow. 
and I sang and I danced and I acted. And uh, unfortunately, the show closed after eight performances, not because I wasn't wonderful. <laughs> but um, after that, I actually did a little stand up and I used to go on back to back with another guy you, nobody's ever heard of, uh, Jerry Seinfeld. Yeah, no one's ever heard of him. Yeah, right. So I worked <laughs> at the comic strip where I did stand up. And then one day I said, hmm, I think I either have to take a vacation or a job. Let's see, a vacation or a job? <laughs> so... I took a vacation and came out to L.A. And I thought, of course, when I came out here that I, I, was, I, I had to stay because I just loved it. And when I decided to stay, I thought I was going to do acting because that's where my passions were. But I had an idea for a screenplay. And everybody said to me, oh, you'll never get anybody to look at it and it, you'll never get an agent. And they were wrong. I got a top agent right away. I had a huge star who wanted a star in it and I got a lot of activity on it. Unfortunately, it didn't get made, but I did make some money and got into the business and was better at writing and worked harder at writing than at acting or at biology. <laughs> and uh, so I became a writer. And... Uh, I, I wrote screenplays, but then I also got onto a bunch of different um, television shows, both freelance, and then I did a staff job as well. Oh, man. So when you leave the, the science field, what was the reaction of the people around you? Was it like, oh, you must be crazy? <laughs> <laughs> well, especially my mother. <laughs> you know, for, for years after I'd gone into show business, she kept telling people about the great job I used to have. <laughs> But And even now, I think about the great pension I'd have if I had stayed yeah. with the National Academy of Sciences, right? But no, it was the right thing. I, the funny thing is, when I was very young, like in, in elementary school, I was on the school newspaper, and I did shows as an actress and singer and dancer. And then when I got into high school and college, the emphasis was always on academics, and so I think I put aside my creative instincts and passions, and my mother wanted me to meet a doctor. <laughs> so I met them. I just didn't marry them. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so then when I got out of school and I realized that I didn't want to be in the science field, I went back to my true passions, which were the creative life and the arts. And no one can blame you for that. You know, you got to follow what's in your heart, what, what really gets you going. The pension would be nice, but I think about all that time and all those years that would have been towards something that you really weren't that excited about. I think you made the right choice here. I know I made the right choice. And people used to ask me, they'd say, well, did you ever think of going back to biology? And I thought, if I ever went back to anything, it wouldn't be that because I always go forward to new things. And that was really not where I belonged. Yeah. Um, although I did also write a book about frogs, but the human frog, not the, uh, <laughs> that was never kiss a frog. So I studied frogs in biology, but I wrote about never kiss a frog, a girl's guide to creatures from the dating swamp. So, so that's as close to biology as you got. That's... Yes. Right. <laughs> so then you end up making this film called how to beat a bully and that's out in stores now. Can you tell us how that has come about? Because this has been quite a journey for you. It's been quite a journey. Um, as I said, I had written for a lot of television shows. I wrote for um, Fame. I wrote for um, uh, Murphy Brown. And I won an award for that. And wow. I, I wrote for Fame and Friday the 13th, the series. I say I can kill six people an hour. Unfortunately, <laughs> not the people of my choice. <laughs> But, um, but screenplays have always been my true love, even all the time I was writing. And I, I think I mentioned I, I was on Carol and Company, which was a, uh, a half-hour series with Carol Burnett. And it also had Jeremy Piven and Richard Kind in the first time that they ever did television. So I feel responsible for their careers, you know, since I wrote well, their yeah. first TV words. I would hope but, that you're um, in their wills. Yeah, that would be <laughs> nice. That would be nice. But I always had the passion to write screenplays. So I had teamed up uh, with my writing partner, Richard Rosner. And at the time, Home Alone came out and was a huge, huge success. And so many people were saying that they needed more films that they could take their children to. Because at the time, I mean, that was a real... Um, of course, it was a huge box office hit, but it, it wasn't the tone of a lot of the movies that were coming out then. 
And so Richard and I had seen it and the world had seen it, Home Alone. Yeah. And we said, uh, let's write another family film. And that's how we decided to get started on it. And so we, we investigated the idea of uh, doing a, a story about a kid and his dad because it's a really nice father-son story. And uh, uh, we came up with this idea that we thought was really fun, which was the idea of a kid who moves to a new town and he gets picked on by bullies. And uh, he asks his dad, of course, what, what can I do? And his father gives him some lame fatherly advice. <laughs> so he's watching TV one night, a gangster show, and so the next day, when the bullies pick on him, he tells them his father is a hitman for the mob. <laughs> well, of course, at first, nobody believes him. But then through a series of circumstances, they do. And that's because his father is an inept insurance salesman. <laughs> and he's telling everybody they need protection and to take out a contract. <laughs> and pretty soon, uh, the kids and the whole town think that he really is with the mob. And then the real mob finds out and they capture the father, and so now the kid and his friends have to save his dad from the mob. So we came up with this idea and thought, this could be a really fun movie, and we wrote it. And as soon as we wrote it, we had so much interest. I mean, we must have met with producers and studios all over town, and our agent said, oh, well, I can sell this over the weekend. Yeah. And what happened was um, we optioned it, not once, not twice, not three times or five times or six times. Over the years, we optioned, optioned it eight different times to eight different Hollywood producers. And of course, they all said, oh, we're going to make it. We love it. There were some stars attached to it. And after this happened the last time, I finally said, no more options. I'm not going to do it anymore. Because... It wasn't getting us anywhere. I mean, we were meeting a lot of people and they kept saying they like it. And I think one of the reasons it didn't take off the way it should was because after Home Alone, a lot of other family movies came out that were flops. And because they were flops, suddenly the tone of the town had changed and they didn't want to do family movies anymore. So the people that were optioned it had good intentions, but they weren't making it happen anymore. For the people who are listening who are screenwriters, each time somebody would option it, we would have to make some changes because everybody who comes in sort of has their own ideas of what they want and mm -hmm. how they should change it. So the script did evolve over all those options. Can you walk us through what that looks like when you actually option a piece? Well, an option is if, if a company or a producer wants to try to sell your script what they will do is they'll take out an option. It could be for a year. It could be for six months. And um, they sometimes will try to get it for no money. But obviously what you want to do is have them pay for the um, right to take it around and also to take it off the market. Because if somebody options it, usually it's exclusive. So they might option it, like I say, for, for um, a year and then they would pay you, and they could pay you anywhere from $500 to $10,000 to $20,000, depending on what the script is and how much they want it or how big a star you are, whatever, in the business. Yeah. And so essentially they'll option it for some amount of time and some amount of money. And then they, the producer, they will try to set it up. They'll try to attach stars or they'll try to get a studio to do it. And then if they haven't, accomplish that by the end of their option period, sometimes they'll have the opportunity to renew the option or they'll just let it go because they haven't been successful in raising the money or getting a studio on board or getting the package together. Okay. And so you just continue this process of going down that road, just trying to get the picture made. Well, in fact, whenever we had it optioned, Almost every six months, we get a call from a different producer saying, whatever happened to my favorite script? Is it available now? Oh, you know, and, a, and one group actually optioned it two different times because they always loved the script. That's one thing. We always got compliments, and we always had people who loved the script. 
And the interesting thing is when we started the script, as I said, it's, it's, um, it was under a different title. Uh, at first it was called Son of a Gun. And at one time it was called Kid Fellas. <laughs> and, it, uh, and it won a couple contests actually between the options. We, uh, we entered it in a couple contests and, and it uh, came in second in um, Scriptapalooza and in American Screenwriting Competition, which was very special because usually those kinds of contests, the winners are usually like heavy, dramatic, meaningful films. Okay. And although this is meaningful, it doesn't have the, um, the gravitas that some of the more serious uh, dramas do. So it was very, very nice to win. And of course, along with the win, we got some, a little bit of money and, mm -hmm. and um, some, some screenwriting software. But we did, as I said, we had some different titles. Mm -hmm. And then um, we also made some changes in the script because originally the very, very first version of the script, the mob guys had guns. Okay. And one of the times when we optioned it, the producer said, you know, this is for kids. You got to take the guns out. No guns. And we thought, how can we have mobsters without guns? But we actually went back and did another draft and took out the guns and it ended up being funnier okay because we had to find other other things that they could do and we also had a really funny explanation why one of the why the head mobster marco marconi never <laughs> carried a gun and it was really really um funny although it did not make it into the final final movie that got made but okay. there are no guns in this movie which is even though there are mobsters but okay. <laughs> yeah that that has to be a little tricky and I was thinking about the time frame because I'm thinking, okay, uh, uh, Home Alone that would have been about 92, 93, somewhere in there. And uh, so you're you're writing this around the time of in between Goodfellas, Casino, all these big time mob films that were very successful. So I'm sure the intrigue with the storyline had to be there, uh, you know, just for whatever reason, it just wasn't getting that final push. Yeah, I mean, we would call it, you know, Home Alone meets The Godfather. Yeah. And then later, Home Alone meets The Sopranos. And uh, now somebody's called it Home Alone meets Big Fat Liar. Okay. So so we have that. But um, the other thing, when I decided not to option it anymore, yeah. the other thing I decided is to change the title. Because I thought bullying has become such a major issue. Mm -hmm. And I thought how to beat a bully captured that it does have the anti-bullying theme but it's also kind of cute and catchy and i i thought it might get more attention yeah but what really happened is when i decided no more options all of a sudden all of the other pieces came into place i showed it to an investor and he flipped for it and he said this has got to be made go make it and then i teamed up with another production company who I think I had shown the script two years before and nothing had happened, but this company had just finished making a couple of other family films. Okay. So, um, so they loved it and they brought in another investor and within six months we were cast and in production. Wow. And of course it only took like 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> so walk us through that as well. So you decide that you're just done doing options. You're going to try to produce this independently. What's your thought process in going into that world because it's just totally different from what you've been used to. It is totally different. And I've been a writer for a long time. I've not only, uh, as I mentioned before, been on staff or written for TV shows, but I had sold feature scripts. I sold them to some studios. I sold them to some independents. But I was never, you know, behind the camera or behind the scenes other than as a writer. Yeah. So suddenly I'm a producer. <laughs> and uh, as I said, I found the initial investor. And uh, then I teamed up with a production company. And what was good about that was that they had um, the infrastructure to go make the movie. Mm -hmm. They had made a few other family films. So they knew that market. They loved that market. And so uh, we teamed up and then we started, you know, getting the crew together uh, finding the director and uh, the the on stage, you know, on producers, the other producers, mm -hmm. and then we went into casting, and that was really fun. I love the cast that we've got. 
I will say if I was going to do another independent film, I think it would be important to get at least one name. Yeah. Because um, even with the kids movie, you know, we felt that we didn't need it because the star was the concept. And also it's going to kids who really don't know a lot of stars. And because we were doing it also on a low budget, there wasn't a lot of money for a star. But I do believe these days that even without a lot of money, you should try to reach out to a name because it does make a difference in the distribution world. Yeah. The other thing that had to be changed a little is... When we went independent, instead of going with a studio, you know, before we were talking about it being, you know, a $10 million, $20 million film. Yeah. Well, now the budget was much, much lower. So what we had to do was do a little streamlining of the script to take out huge scenes um, or huge, huge uh, casts. We had to pare down the cast a little, pare down some of the locations and some of the physical bits. Although I have to say, we totally retained the fun and the comedy and and the story. So although we are hoping that some big studio will come by and say, oh, we want to remake this now as a big studio film. Okay. So that is something that you have on the radar. Oh, yeah. We also have a sequel in the radar. And we also, we're actually writing the novel, How to Beat a Bully, uh, that could be like a companion piece, especially if it goes to schools or to yeah. to other places. So that and the novel that we're writing is going to be based on our original screenplay, which which has a lot more twists and turns because it was a bigger budget. That's really cool. So uh, I didn't really have this question in mind before, but uh, just in conversation here, have you seen that you know that this might be going beyond just making a film for you that you know, you're really impacting kids, you know, and I can tell that, you know, you guys are having an awesome impact. You were telling me uh, before we started rolling that you had a screening at a school and how successful that was, you know, is this uh, kind of changed your perspective on uh, your writing or, or how you're viewing your career? Well, I have to say I'm first and foremost, a creative person. I'm, I'm a I'm an artist, you know, and that's what I love to do. I love to create stories. Mm -hmm. And screenplays are really my favorite medium, although I've written some books and I'm, I've am i just done a web series that I'm going to launch very soon. But screenplays are really my, my, my forum. And although I've written thrillers also, and I wrote three Friday the 13th, the series, <laughs> comedy is also my favorite thing. Yeah. But because this has the theme of, anti-bullying, which is so important. What we realized was when we were writing this, first of all, we did take from our own lives. I was bullied as a kid. I was bullied in high school. A girl used to hit me every time she walked down the hall and wow. saw me. And and Richard, my writing partner, he was called Melonhead in school. So we've both been down that road. And almost everybody that we talk to tells us they have some kind of bullying story. Mm -hmm. So we would love to share this like with, with schools or community centers or, or churches or any kind of place. Because what we found is so many stories of bullying are sad or depressing. Mm -hmm. And here we've created one that we think can bring laughs and smiles to kids and parents and teachers. But at the same time, it does have the theme, it's better to be friends than bullies. So uh, a community in West Point, Nebraska, um, what they did is they arranged a fantastic day uh, where uh, they had a theater and they invited during the day um, kids from two different schools, grade three, four, five, and six, to come see the film. And then afterwards, they had a Q&A section with um, one of the stars of the film. It's funny. I mean, there were some questions about bullying, but they really wanted to know about the filmmaking and how that happened <laughs> and stuff, which was which was funny. And oh, and the kids also he said the question that was asked one more than once was in, in the film, the, the husband kisses the wife. And they mm -hmm. said, what? How was it to kiss the girl? <laughs> <laughs> so that was funny. But the bottom line is they had a huge, huge turnout. And at the end of the film, they didn't just. Um, applaud they cheered so that was very heartening and then at night the theater showed the film again uh, for the adults in the community 
and also had the Q&A afterwards. So we would love to do more of that. And we feel it is a way to reach out. And, you know, we could do it like by hooking up with a charity and giving part of the proceeds to an anti-bullying organization or a kid's charity. And uh, if anybody out there listening knows teachers or schools or anti-bullying advocates who would like to arrange a screening, we'd, we'd love to do that because it is nice to have that other possibility besides just entertaining people to sort of open up a discussion about something that's important. And of course, bullying is such a problem today. Sure. I love that. So what has the, the marketing been like for you since, so you get the movie produced and again, this is your first dive into indie film. You have the film. Now what? Good question. <laughs> because everybody thinks, oh, I made the film, that's it. But if you're in the independent world, that's the smallest part of it. The biggest part of it is is distribution and, and also publicity and promotion. And, and that's a whole other different hat that you have to wear as a filmmaker. You know, if you're lucky enough to have a budget for uh, promotion and publicity and a publicist, but a lot of independent filmmakers don't go into it either realizing it or knowing how important it is. So to get distribution, we do have a foreign uh, sales agent and the film has already been sold to France and South Africa and to Latin America. And we have um, a bunch of other countries hopefully going to be buying it very soon. I can't talk about them yet. So that's exciting. So he does, our sales rep does go to places like the AFM or to the Toronto Film Festival or to Cannes and, and market it to other countries. Mm -hmm. But foreign distribution and domestic distribution are very different. And domestic distribution, and, and to some degree foreign distribution, is what really also would be where having a name or a celebrity in it would help. Yeah. And of course, we don't have that, but we still have great actors who I think will become celebrities. In fact, one of the kids who is in our film as one of the leads, he just got a lead in a new Disney um, show. And so hopefully when that comes out uh, at the end of this year, because he's a lead, yeah. that could make our film take off a little more here, too. Yeah. So as far as distribution in the, in domestic, there are a lot of big distribution companies that, you know, people are thrilled if they can get to. Now, what I've heard, um, you know, and we sent it to a few of them, but because we didn't have a star, they loved the film, but they were looking for films that had stars in them. Mm -hmm. So we have gone with an independent company called Indie Rights, and they have distributed our, our film on Amazon and iTunes, and Vudu, and uh, Google Play. Okay. So they're all available there, streaming either to rent or buy. But we also got a wonderful coup, which was our DVD company. And uh, we are now on Walmart shelves, which is a really big coup for a little movie, because yeah. it doesn't happen with a lot of independent films. So um, we're now on Walmart shelves. Uh, so everybody go to your local Walmart and see if it's on the shelves and take a picture with it. If you send it in, we're having a contest. The best picture is going to get something special. Awesome. <laughs> so we're out in Walmart now. And the thing is, now that it's out there now, like you can have the best product in the world. But if nobody knows it's there, it's no good. Mm -hmm. So what we have to do now, we have the distribution, is the publicity and the promotion. And as I said, you know, with, with studio pictures, they spend more on publicity and promotion than they do on making the movie. Yeah. You know, if a movie costs $30 million, they might spend $70 million on what's called P&A, prints and advertising. So with a little film, you don't have that extra marketing budget. So you have to do everything you can. And that's where social media comes in. You know, Facebook, we have a really nice Facebook page. And we're trying to spread the word through Facebook and just trying to send out some press releases. But that's really the hard part, is getting people to know about a little movie because it might not have a star. And if we had a star, we could be getting on all the TV shows. But without a star, that's difficult. So... 
Did you have an idea of what you were getting into when you decided to go independent with it? Did you think the road might be a little bit easier or did you expect what you're dealing with here? Well, I am learning a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it is a journey. It's a real journey. There's so many things that come up that you just wouldn't have expected from technical issues with delivering what they need to get it out to all these places. And I'm not a technical person, you know, I'm a writer. Yeah. So I create the words and the scenes and this and the situations. And I love doing that, but I'm really not technically uh, savvy at all. So some of our other people on board who are either the producers or certainly the director know much more about that end. But when you have to go out to these digital platforms, it has to be delivered in a certain way. Also, when you uh, hook up with a sales agent, you have to provide them with a lot of technical specs. And then, as I said, after it's all ready to go, and I am generally good at publicity and promotion, but that I feel like publicity and promotion is almost an addiction mm. because it's something that you can never get enough of or do enough for. And there's so much to do. It's never ending. You could work, you know, 40 hours in a day, not in a week, and <laughs> still have all kinds of places to contact and try to get hold of. And you never know necessarily how effective it is. Sure. And we're always trying to try new things. So, yes, I've learned a lot and I'm still learning. Well, I appreciate that. You know, you thinking about your entire journey going from a totally different career and, and taking that time in between. I think a lot of people would have just given up, you know, even it, having the options out there. I think it would be easy to just fold. But you decided to say, no, we're going to venture forward, do this independent We'll get it out there. And so I really yeah. applaud you for that. And I think what, you, you know, if you're involved, if you're the writer, it's different. And somebody just buys your film, um, then you're done and you just go on to the next project. But if you're the producer, you know, you feel a, a responsibility to the investors. So you want to not only have it out there, but you want to have it make, make money. You want to be able to pay your mm -hmm. investors back. And then, yay, if that happens, you want to be able to make some money yourself. Yeah. But that seems to be, it gets harder. And the question becomes, how much time do you, do you put into now this movie that's out but that needs your attention for publicity or writing your next project either to sell or to make or, you know, your other projects that you want to work? So it's a juggling act, too. Mm-hmm. Now, I did write another movie that um, I'm not a producer on, but I wrote a romantic comedy also with my partner, Richard Rosner. And uh, we wrote that for uh, another independent producer. And that is supposed to start shooting later this year. And it's a romantic comedy. So I'm really excited about that because that's also a genre that I that I love. And it's a romantic comedy about a wedding. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So you got a lot in the hopper. Do you feel like some of this has come due to the success of How to Beat a Bully? I will say it's given me a new sense of power okay. that I didn't have before, that I don't have to wait yeah. for other people to, to say yes or to give me a job, that I can now go out and do things myself. Yeah. And uh, actually, in line with that, I have I just um, created, I wrote, produced, and I actually star in or host a new web series oh, cool. that I have nine episodes on. It's called How to Live Like a Millionaire When You're a Million Short. Love and it. so I'm writing the book, but I also went out and uh, did nine, like, three-minute episodes. And so I'm going to be launching that within the next few weeks, probably. Great. And uh, again, it's something that before I never would have thought of. I just would have, you know, tried to get work from other people. But Hollywood has changed a lot. And the whole landscape of the business has changed because of the Internet. Yeah. I mean, there's so many more places to go. And there are more opportunities now for people to do things independently and to put them up and to find your own followers and following you don't have to wait for a studio to say yes you are worthy yeah. you can put it out and let the audience tell you if you're worthy that's awesome 
So we have a lot of screenwriters that are listening, and I, I feel like you've already shared a ton of nuggets, but if they're kind of feeling like they're down and out, what would your encouragement be to them? Well, number one, believe in yourself. And if you believe in yourself, don't give up. I mean, because if you think of something as good, don't give up. I mean, I have a story from when I took my first screenwriting class and I had I had um, written my first script and gotten all the advice. Oh, you'll never get anybody to look at it, blah, blah, blah. And I took this class and there are a bunch of screenwriters and we would read a different script every week. Mm -hmm. And the teacher was very kind to some really horrible screenplays. And then they read mine and he totally ripped it to shreds. I mean, to shreds. Oh, wow. And the only reason it didn't bother me was because just that week I had heard from CAA that they wanted to represent it and from Billy Crystal that he wanted a star in it. <laughs> <laughs> And here he was ripping it to shreds. So after class, I said, you know, um, <laughs> said, well, maybe I looked at it wrong. So, I mean, take everything that people say and just, you know, if, if five different people point to the same thing that's wrong in a script, maybe it's time for you to look at it and fix it. But one person's opinion, even if it's a teacher, doesn't necessarily mean uh, it's bad. Or, or good for that matter. I mean, you just have to, if you believe in something, keep it going. The other thing I recommend to new screenwriters is there's a lot of contests and you can always submit your screenplay to a contest. And if it's really good, I mean, the biggest one is the Nickel Screenwriting Fellowship. And anybody who wins that, like Hollywood comes to them. And, uh, and also now there's all these pitch fests around, like you can go in person or you can go online and submit your screenplays to virtual pitch fest and get feedback there and, and possibly find somebody who likes your work. So there's, and then you can go out and you can make little things and you can post them. Yeah. And this is how a lot of people are getting noticed, whether they're screenwriters or, or actors or just personalities they're becoming famous from doing and rich from doing their own thing you know yeah. so i just say if you really have a passion for it you know write something uh but rewrite it because the first pass is not going to be the one that you want to send out yeah. so my advice would be to absolutely work your script over and over show it to somebody who whose opinion you trust go to a consultant go to a you know and, and make sure it's in the best shape it can be in because first impressions are very important. So you want to, but if somebody turns it down, you don't have to, you know, pull in your tail and go home just because one person doesn't like it. I mean, I don't like chocolate ice cream, but it sure sells a lot, you know? So if you believe in yourself, you got to keep doing it. Yeah. That's awesome. So how can we be helping you promote how to beat a bully? Oh, I would love for you to do that. Well, you can buy it at Walmart, which is great, or it's on Amazon, iTunes, uh, Vudu, and Google Play. And we'd love for you to watch it. We'd also love to get reviews because this is another thing you learn when you're out there on digital platforms is the more reviews you get, um, it helps. It helps, you know, tell people and it helps people want to buy it. So we love reviews. Of course, I say, if you like it, give us a positive review. If you don't like it, review Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> but no, we'd love to to have that help. And we'd, we'd love to give you some laughs and some fun and, you know, share it with, with kids, with parents, with with teachers, you know. And, um, and if you need another movie written, I'm here. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. Well, this has been great, Marilyn, and I really appreciate you taking your time to share your story and your journey. So what's the best way for people to get in touch with you? Well, uh, our website is howtobeatabullythemovie.com. And if you go there, it, it also has links to the film on Amazon and iTunes and also to our Facebook page. And you can certainly write to us if you uh, sign up at our Facebook page, we're going to be not, uh, or on our website, we don't write to people a lot, but when we have like little extras and things, we may send you out. Uh, we have a new song that's coming out and a new music video that's going to be out soon on uh, YouTube. And uh, 
that's great also to share with uh, kids and their classmates in school. So we want to share the word about how to beat a bully. That's awesome. And we'll have links to that stuff in the show notes. And oh, we'll, thank you. You betcha. And we'll just uh, say goodbye. Thank you again, Marilyn. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Wow, that was some awesome stuff. Marilyn is a great person. I'm so glad that we got to have her on the show. What a unique story of going from a lucrative career to something that was a bit of a risk. It wasn't a bit of a risk. It's a risk, you know, and I really applaud her for taking that chance. And, you know, we all have these opportunities in life where we have to say, yeah, we're going to go for it or we're not. And there's a time and place for both. You know, maybe you're in a situation where you have kids or, you know, you don't want to do anything that's going to damage relationships, of course. But at some point, it's okay to take a chance because we only get one shot at life. And why not go for those dreams that are in your heart? So I want to encourage you with that. And I also want to encourage you that, you know, like Marilyn, she had worked in Hollywood for quite a while. She had been working with studios for quite a while. And things weren't working out that way. So she went the indie route and she learned some new stuff and she's making it happen. So whatever you want to make, you can go make it. Just go make it. You don't have to have everything in place because the truth is the perfect time will never be there. Right now is what you got. So you might as well use it. So that wraps up this episode of Filmmakers Focus. And I look forward to hearing from you on Twitter and on Facebook, email, been hearing some great stuff from you guys, and it means a lot. Have a great week. We'll see you next time. Go and grow.